We're going to look at verses 25 and 26. Ephesians in chapter number 5. Verses 25 and 26 this morning. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water, by the word, notice the phrase there, even as Christ also loved the church. Let's pray together this morning. Lord, I thank you for your great love for us. Lord, we confess this morning that we are unworthy of your love. But Lord, we also confess that we're so thankful that you love us. Lord, I pray you'd bless every person in this building this morning. Everyone that's been able to come and gather with us. Lord, I pray as well for those connected and gathered with us via our live stream digitally this morning. Those who are not able yet to be with us in person. Lord, I pray that you would bless them. Lord, I pray that you would meet the need on every heart. Lord, we simply want your best for us and for every person this morning. Lord, I pray that you would be lifted up. Lord, I pray that we would worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, I pray that your word would go forth powerfully this morning, dear Holy Spirit of God. I pray that you would help me as I endeavor to preach and teach and write your truth. Lord, I pray you take from my mind anything that would be harmful to the cause of Christ. Lord, help me to say those things, Lord, that you'd once said this morning. Lord, as we talk about the church, Lord, how vital, Lord, so vital that you were willing to die. Lord, bless us this morning. May you be glorified in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. We see in that verse, in verse 25, as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Here's the question this morning from this passage. We're going to look at some other verses this morning, but the question is, what is this thing that Jesus gave himself for? What is this that God loves so much? What is this that the Bible says in verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word? What is the church? Because of our experience over the last few months and our culture, not only here but around the world, there's been an emphasis on churches being online. And as a church, we've done the best that we can uh, to try to uh, make it possible for those many of you who uh, for several weeks or maybe several months have been uh, trying to connect via our live stream, many that are watching right now, and we appreciate the fact that they are so glad that we can do that. Uh, We're trying all the time to do a little better job. We had some uh, technical difficulties this morning during our Sunday school. I apologize. I think it was my fault. We set some new things up uh, this morning. But there's been that statement, and I've seen made in social media, that, uh, you know, we we don't have to go to a building to have church. And that's true. You see, this building is not the church. This facility that the Lord has given us and that we are slowly trying to uh, make a better vessel to to minister to the needs of, of your family and to our community and to our city, Uh, This building is not a church, but it is the building that houses the church. You see, the church is the assembling of God's people. I praise God for the digital platform that we have, an opportunity for folks to connect with us. But gathering 
in separate homes and separate living rooms and, uh, or bedrooms or uh, your porch or wherever you are and uh, staring at a screen and somebody else in their home staring at a screen. Uh, I praise God that we can connect that way, but that's not the church. You see, the fact is the church is when we gather together. The word church comes from the word ecclesia, uh, which means a called out assembly. How many of you remember uh, fire drills when you were growing up? Do you ever have a fire drill when you were in elementary school or junior high or high school? I remember one time when I was in Bible college, I was in the shower. And you can laugh now because you know where it's going. I was in the shower. I was on Rice One. Did you ever live in Rice One? I was on, I was on Rice One, uh, 105, I think, 107. I don't remember now. And I was in the shower. And all of a sudden, I heard, and I'm like in the shower going, I'm taking a shower. Can I tell you the safest place to be when there's a fire? In the shower. And part of me said, I'm staying in the shower. But then the dorm supervisor running down the hallway saying, get outside, there's a fire, fire drill. That part of me said, I guess I better go. You know what I had with me? I had a towel and I had a bathrobe. So I wrapped myself in a towel, grabbed my bathrobe. I went outside. I was standing out in the field back behind uh, the men's dormitories. One of the men came out, one of the staff men said, what are you doing? Outside in a bathrobe and a towel. I was taking a shower. Did you want me to go put a shirt and tie on? Uh, I had to get outside. It was a, I, there was a call to assemble. Uh, it wasn't a question of whether or not I was going to assemble. The alarm went off and I had to assemble. Can I tell you that the church is the assembly of God's people? And I want us to see just a couple of things this morning, uh, not a lengthy message, but I believe an important message. You see, the Bible says the church, God loved the church, Jesus died for the church. Uh, Jesus, the Bible says in verse number 26, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, verse 27, that he might present it to himself. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that should be holy and without blemish. How many of you would like to not have spots and wrinkles anymore? The older I get, the more spots I get, the more wrinkles I get. Uh, but the Bible talks about the church, this assembling of God's people. This morning, this building we're in is not the church, but can I tell you that we gathered here because we have gathered for His purpose in His name. We are the church. And I want to talk, just give you three very simple points about, or four this morning. What is, what is the church? Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy in chapter number 3 with me this morning. And I promise we will not have a fire drill here this morning. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter number 3 and verse number 15. First Timothy 3.15, but if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest, notice the phrase here, to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Number one this morning, what is the church? The church is a house, the house of God. Not a building. We're not talking about the building this morning. Uh, we've already established that the church is not a place. The church is not a facility. The church is the assembling of God's people, a called out assembly of God's people. And the church is, on top of that, a house for God to rule. Notice the phrase there in verse 15. It says that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. How many of you were born and raised in Canada? How many of you were born 
uh, in the United States. How many of you were born uh, in India? Oh, there we go. We got a couple over there. Uh, now, the culture and, and the Philippines, we don't, have, we don't have any Filipinos here. No, no, no Filipinos this morning. Uh, any other countries represented here this morning? Ireland. Man, they came all the way from Ireland. They, they looked for the pot of gold. They're still looking. All they found was a big Blarney stone. Uh, but the fact is, many of us in our cultures, we had things that we did in our homes that are different than others did in their homes. For instance, growing up in the southern United States, we did not take our shoes off to go in the house. Ever. Unless you're going to bed. We didn't sleep with our boots on. Uh, but, you know, you, you come in a in house, if you go to visit someone in their house, uh, our culture and the custom was you left your shoes on. I came to Canada the first time back in 2001, and I remember the first home that I went into in Canada, and as I was coming in, I was told, hey, take your shoes off. Okay, that's kind of weird. Now, I've lived in Canada for 15 years. You know what happens when I go to the U.S.? I take my shoes off when I go in the house, because that's what I'm used to. Now, there are many other things that you may have done in your home or, or maybe where you were born or in your culture that are different in your home than in someone else's home. It may be very much so here even in our city that, uh, and I'm sure if we went row to row, uh, there are things that different families do and they have different rules and different things in their house than other, another family or another person has in their house. Can I tell you that the church... The assembly of God's people is God's house. And He's the one that makes the rules for the house. He's the one that decides how we ought to behave. I mean, God's given us a, a rule book. God's given us a, a means to understand how we ought to behave ourselves as we ought to be like Christ. But understand the church, the gathering of God's people, it is a house for God to rule and how wonderful we can be a part. How wonderful to be a part of His house. How wonderful that we can be a part of, of God's plan. You know, this morning we have a privilege as children of God, as we come together, as we come together as a family, to realize that we are part of His house. Look, if you will, at Ephesians chapter 1. We'll look at a couple of verses here in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1, we started in Ephesians 5, but back in Ephesians 1, verse 22. Ephesians 1, verse 22, and, and hath put all things under his feet. And gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Notice this. Which is his body, speaking of Christ, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Dear friend, this morning, if you are a born again child of God, as you come together this morning here, in this local assembly, this local church, as we gather together, the Bible says that the church, by the way, the church that he loved, the church he died for, uh, the church that he wants to present to himself, spotless and perfect and holy, without spot and without wrinkle. The Bible says here in Ephesians 1, verse 22 and verse 23, that the church is the body, the body of Christ. How many of you that are not parents fed somebody breakfast today besides yourself. Anybody? Imagine that. Now, there's probably some moms or dads here this morning. You had to feed your child. Maybe you had to do the the airplane. Uh, maybe you wives had to feed your husbands. Uh, any wives had to feed? I hope not. Uh, any, any husbands had to feed your wives? I've never seen that happen before. Uh, but probably there's not many people outside of someone in a care facility. There's not many people in an average 
uh, situation and a healthy, uh, a, someone that's healthy, someone that uh, has uh, their capacities, it's quite unusual that somebody else would feed them other than a little small child. But I'm guessing that even if you didn't eat breakfast this morning, that at some point between the time you woke up this morning and the time you go to bed tonight, you're going to feed yourself. Brother Jojo, I'm guessing. I could be wrong. But before the day's over, you're going to feed yourself something. I'm, I'm just guessing. I can tell Jerese has already fed himself something today. You can see a little bit of swelling there underneath of his tie. Uh, Brother Bonnie, don't laugh. I, I see your gut up there hanging over the edge. Uh, we, we, we feed ourselves. Why? Because it's us. We get hungry. Got to make sure we're hungry. It's been said that children wear coats because mommy is cold. How many of you ever heard that statement before? Kids go outside, oh, I'll put a coat on. The kid's like, I'm fine, mom, but mom's cold. That's why you wear a coat. Uh, but we eat and we feed ourselves. Why? Because we're hungry. Now, the Bible says here in Ephesians that we are the body of Christ. And notice verse 23, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Can I tell you that because we are part of the body of Christ, and as we gather this morning, we gather together as the body of Christ, it is Christ who fills us, who meets our need, who provides for us, who strengthens us, who encourages us. Understand the church is the body of Christ that Christ supplies. He meets the need of. How many of you have ever gone to a gas station and someone else has pulled up at the gas pump and said, hey, let, let me pay for your gas? Maybe you have. That'd be a wonderful thing. Uh, if you do that, let me know where you're going to be and I'll bring my vehicle there. Uh, but probably that's not something that happens very often. If you're like me, I hate going to the gas station. I, I can't, I hate it. I hate paying for gas. Uh, I hate taking the time to stop for gas. So I wait until my gas gauge is almost below E before I stop. How many of you are like that? And then the rest of you, you get below a half a tank and you have to go. I, I know how you are uh, because I'm married to one of those people. And praise the Lord, we have to balance each other out. If I didn't have her, I'd be on the side of the road with no gas. That's what would happen to me. Uh, but we don't want to stop and get gas, but we do. Why? Because it, you have to fill it up. You got to get gas if you want to keep going. Can I tell you that the Lord Jesus Christ fills us? and strengthens us, and feeds us, because we're part of His body. The church that the Bible says that He died for, that He loved. The, the church that He gave a pattern to husbands, and husbands, love your wives, even as I love the church. What is the church? It's a house of God, a house for God. Number two, the body, the body of Christ Look here in verse 20, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, the next chapter. Ephesians chapter 2, just across the page there, maybe for you, in verse 22, or verse 21, excuse me. In whom all the building, fitly framed together, groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. In whom ye also are builded together for an Notice the phrase here, an habitation, an habitation of God through the Spirit. What is the church? We said the church is the house for God. It's a body for Christ. Number three, the church, the, the, the local gathering, assembling of believers as we're called out. Number three, the church is a temple for the Spirit of God. In the Old Testament, God's people left Egypt. They crossed the Red Sea. And God was leading them to a place we know of as the promised land, Canaan. Now, God's people were stubborn. None of you have ever been stubborn, have you? Uh, God's people were complainers. Have any of you ever complained? Probably not. Uh, God's people made some dumb decisions. Anybody ever done that? Both, 
Uh, I can't lift the other one up or I'd fall down. That'd be a dumb decision. But God's people were on their way to the promised land, and, but because of their wrong decisions, because of their complaining, because of their unbelief, they took 40 years to get there. Anybody ever been on a trip that lasted 40 years? I've been on some trips that felt like they took 40 years. I was with some teenagers last summer. And, well, Josh, you were there. Uh, it seemed like it took 40 years. Uh, no, but 40 years. Now, on the way to the promised land, they traveled. They lived in tents. They didn't have buildings that they built. They had portable, they called them tabernacles, portable places to live. And there was a temple in the wilderness. It was not a building built with stones and built with lumber. It was a building built with the skins of animals. It was a tent, if you will. It was a tent that could be taken down and and moved a little ways and set back up again and taken down again and moved and set back up somewhere else. The word was tabernacle. The word tabernacle means a temporary dwelling place a temporary place of housing. Now, when God's people got to the promised land, they built a temple. It was a permanent place of dwelling. The only difference was one was movable, the other was immovable. Christian, this morning, the church, God describes the church as a temple for His Spirit, a tabernacle. This morning, a Christian child of God, God's Spirit dwells inside of you. And He dwells in us and with us. The Bible says where two or more are gathered together, God said, I will be in the midst of you. We see in this passage in Ephesians 2, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. That is a powerful thought. By the way, not a, not a building, not a structure. It's not about the place. It has nothing to do with the place. It has to do with that called out assembly of God's people. It is a house for God. The church is a house for God. The church is a body for Christ to supply and a temple or tabernacle for the Spirit to indwell. When I was a little boy, I had a hermit crab. And a hermit crab's a unique creature. I don't know if they taste like lobster or not. I should have tried it. But uh, a little crustacean. And it lives inside. It takes up residence inside of a shell. And as it starts to grow... As the button starts to almost pop off a shell, uh, he goes, I got to get a bigger shell. So he crawls out of his shell and he finds a bigger shell. He gets inside, nah, this, this one's too big. Uh, oh, yeah, this one fits just right. And he starts living in that second shell. And as he grows again and outgrows that shell, if he lives that long, he goes and finds another shell. He has to find a place that he can cohabit inside of, that he can indwell. I love the fact this morning, church, that God's Spirit, every time we come together, every time we congregate as God commands us to, the Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as a manner of some is. As we come together, we see that God indwells our gathering. By the way, we don't have to invite him. We don't have to ask him. He says that we're two or more gathered together in his name. He's going to be there. He indwells. He indwells the gathering, the congregating, the churching, if you will, of his people. Look lastly with me back in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 1. We're going to look at verse 20, and then I'm going to talk to you just for a few moments about the next couple of chapters. We're not going to read them. But 
Romans or Revelation, excuse me, Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 20. And the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and notice this phrase, the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Can I tell you lastly this morning, what is the church? The church is a lampstand or a candlestick to give light to the world. In the book of Revelation, John was caught up into the third heaven and, and he was given some visions of things that, were, that had happened, some things that would uh, happen, things to come and things in past. And John saw these candlesticks. And God said, let me explain to you what these candlesticks are. These candlesticks are these seven churches. Uh, verse chapter 2, we won't read chapter 2 and chapter 3. But if we read chapter 2 and chapter 3, we would read about those churches. Those candlesticks. Now what's the purpose of a candlestick or a lampstand? So you can see. We were tying together and all of the spaghetti of wires that were hanging out of the ceiling. Uh, we were running them in conduit and uh, we had an electrician here the other day who ran the, the metal conduit and uh, moved some switches for us. And When that happened, the breakers had to be shut off for these lights and the lights in there and there was no light. And as he was working, it was getting a little bit later in the evening, and we got the phones. And turned on the light. And was holding that light. Oh, mine's not working. Man, I'm a bad church. Uh, it's not going to work. Uh, but as we turned those on, we held that light. Now, if I'd taken and turned it on and stuck it in my pocket, like that, it wouldn't have done any good. For that light to help the electrician, I had to take it out and hold it to shine the light. Now the church, what is the church? The church is a lampstand. A lampstand to shine the light. By the way, not the light of the church. but a lampstand to shine the light of the world. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ, the Word of God, is the light. He's the light that lighteth every man. The Bible says a candle. A candle is to be set upon a hill. We're to shine out. Church, this morning when we gather together, understand as we come together, as we make up the church, that one of the reasons we do so is to shine our light. To shine the light of Christ to those around us. To shine the light of Christ to those your brothers and sisters in Christ. To shine the light of Christ to a lost world. To shine the light of Christ in darkness. We see this morning in Scripture, the Bible tells us in Ephesians. Let's turn back there quickly. Ephesians chapter number 5. Husbands, love your wives, verse 25, even as Christ also loved the church. I want you to notice that phrase. He loved the church. I don't believe there's any Christian that would disagree with the statement that we are, as Christians, supposed to be like Christ. We're supposed to love what Christ loves. I've used this illustration before, but my wife loves homegrown tomatoes. I think tomatoes are disgusting. I think they're the fruit that Adam and Eve ate in the Garden of Eden that caused all humanity to fall into sin. Last night I had a donair pizza as I was here working. 
And Brother Darren, God will forgive him one day, but he ordered it. He forgot to tell them not to put the tomatoes on the pizza. So you know what I did? I didn't get the pizza. And you know what? I'm going to love what my wife loves. I didn't do that. I took the tomatoes and tossed them in the trash can where they belong. And then I ate the pizza that had been defiled by touched, being touched by tomatoes. Too many times, Christians, we want to take what Christ loves and throw it out of our life. I'm my own person. I don't need to love what you love. The Bible tells us that Christ loves the church. And as children of God, we ought to love what he loved. We had a love to come together. The psalmist said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. May we learn to love what he loves. May we be excited this morning about the fact that we can be part of his house, his body, his temple. And may we actively be a lampstand a light to the world. We sing the song, the children sing, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. We sing the song, but unless we come as God wants us to, to be part of that lampstand, we're not going to be effective at lighting the world. May we realize the importance. By the way, this morning, one of the wonderful parts of that light shining is that others might see. I was lost one time. How many have ever been lost? I, I was lost in the woods. Now, I've never admitted I was lost in the woods, but I, I, I was, I guess. And I got turned around once when I was a teenager. And I wasn't sure exactly where I was. And it was dark in the bush. And I was kind of going away. I thought was right, and all of a sudden I saw a little dot of light in the distance of the bush. And I went, "That's a house." <laughs> and I started walking towards that light, and I was no longer lost. This morning, if you're here and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Bible says that without Him, we are lost. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Can I tell you this morning that although you may be lost without Christ and you may not know Him as Savior, Jesus Christ is that light. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you come to that light that the Lord is shining out this morning here in this place? Would you trust Him, Christian? Christian, would you make a decision to love what he loves? To be faithful to God's purpose for you. Let's bow our heads in prayer this morning. Lord, I thank you for being a powerful Savior, a wonderful God. Lord, as we come to you, as we humble our hearts, as we bow our heads and close our eyes together this morning, as we come to your truth, Lord, as your spirit is working in us, Lord, I pray that we would make the decisions that you've placed in our heart. God, would you help us this morning to love what you love? God, help us this morning to realize that the church is not a facility, it's not a building, it's not a place. But Lord, it's the gathering of your people for your name and your purpose. And Lord, you're, it's your house. And Lord, you're the one that sets the rules for your house. God, help us to follow those. God, help us to be obedient. God, help us to honor you and not disrespect you. God, I thank you this morning that as a child of God, that I get to be part of your body. And Lord, you supply for your body. You meet the needs of your body. Lord, as we see the picture of the Old Testament tabernacle and later the temple, that place where your spirit resided in the Old Testament, and that holy of holies, 
Lord, I thank you that as you died upon the Calvary's tree, the veil of the temple was rent in twain. No longer does your spirit rest inside a building or a temple or a tent, but Lord, your spirit dwells inside of those who have received you as their Savior. And Lord, that we see the picture here this morning that as a church, as we come together, Lord, we are that place that you dwell in the midst of us. Lord, I thank you as well for allowing us to be part of your purpose and your plan for the world. God, help us to realize that we are to be a lampstand, a light, a candlestick, to shine forth your truth. God, help us to do a better job of that. God, we fail you in so many ways. Lord, I do pray if there be one here this morning that knows you not as Savior, I pray this morning that they would see the light, the light of the love of God. The fact that you came, left heaven, became man and dwelt among us, lived a sinless, spotless, perfect life, the Son of God, were beaten and crucified and died, buried and yet rose again to pay the debt that we all owe, the debt of sin. Lord, I pray they'd realize this morning the Bible is true when it says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And Lord, I pray before they leave this place today that they would make the greatest decision man could ever make, a decision to accept the free gift of eternal life. Lord, would you work in our hearts, help us not just to gather and sing and fellowship, but God, help us to let your word change us, mold us, and make us. And God, may you be glorified for our coming together today. Lord, I pray you bless us now. Lord, I pray you dismiss us with your grace. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can be dismissed this morning. Don't forget tonight at 6 p.m. Uh, we will be uh, have Brother Caleb Turner via uh, live uh, video with us. By the way, if you're watching via our live stream tonight, uh, we will have the video directly there for you. So God bless you and be dismissed.